Now it's my privilege to present our second winner, Dr. Uh, Paul Richardson from Harvard, Dana Farber. I don't need to introduce him. We are really eager to listen to you, Paul. Thank you for coming. Um, Thank, thank you very much, Mohammed, and it's my privilege and true honor to be here and to especially um, share such a wonderful prize with Antonio. Uh, I see ourselves as two clinicians very much in the trenches, and it's particularly lovely to be acknowledged so nicely, Mohammed. So thank you to you, Arnon, and Thierry for such a, uh, a gracious gesture. And I really, in the same vein as Antonio so nicely phrased it, it really is my honor to accept this prize on behalf of my team and our team. And I think what's really remarkable is that the team in myeloma is truly global. And that's why I think it's just a very special privilege to be here um, with you all, because we represent an amazing global network um, that has contributed so much to progress. So when I discussed the, the talk with Mohammed, what I going to do was take you on something of a journey. So it will actually hopefully resonate nicely, but rather be different to what you heard from Antonio, because what it will do is walk you through the last decade, but at the same time also focus critically on the fact that this has really been a team effort. And what I want to show you as we do that graphically is the impact that this has had in the academic space in which we work, because I think we've been so privileged in myeloma to have come such a long way, and that's why it's especially nice today to have Bob here, which is amazing, and of course Jean-Luc and others um, with us, because this represents a continuum of progress um, for which I honestly feel it's been true privilege to be part of, and it's a deep honor to be part of such a remarkable team of investigators. And we must treasure it. And if I may, as one brief digression, as we think of our partnerships with pharma, we must recognize how valuable that is. We wouldn't be here without those partnerships and the value that that confers. And I think that's a very important positive message um, to, to reiterate as we go forward. But with that in mind, let's start with a little bit of uh, a simple science to kick the ball off. Um, and I think basically in that context, I think we're all familiar with the construct that myeloma is a highly diverse and heterogeneous disease. Critically, it depends on its microenvironment, and this is summarized beautifully in a review that both Antonio and Ken wrote some years ago. But I always love this particular diagram because obviously add to this um, the immune repertoire and you begin to understand the complexity of what we face. So I wanted to summarize for us this evening a couple of sort of bullet points about progress and challenges. I think our progress is clear, tremendous understanding of disease biology, and this has translated to the bedside. I'm very careful about the term cure because, quite honestly, in clinic three days a week with 15 patients per session, that's not what I'm seeing. What I am seeing is that there is a functional group of patients in whom they enjoy prolonged and durable remissions. Having said that, our relapsed refractory high-risk population remain as challenging as ever. And in that context, I would beg the question that we also need to think not just about the intensity of therapy and where we place it, but very importantly, what happens downstream? Because as patients live longer with their disease, 15 and 20 years, what we do at diagnosis really matters. And if we're using wonderful workhorse drugs like Melphalan early, great as that drug is, and I, wrote, I remember very fondly working with Tim McElwain, who was the innovator in high-dose therapy, in fact, in that regard. But the reality is, and when Tim published his paper in The Lancet in 1985, the reality is we're now in 2015, 2016. And the question really is, can we get to the same place with perhaps less long-term toxicity risk than we perhaps see, in particular, the entity of secondary malignancies and secondary AML? I just bring that to your attention because it's very relevant to this question of where does transplant belong? And whilst I'm a firm believer it has a role, it's, I think, a tailored approach um, that we need to focus on going forward. A couple of points about key targets in myeloma, just to emphasize these. Excess protein production clearly has been a, an obvious target from which there's been an enormous therapeutic windfall. And I'll spend a little bit of time on that. Uh, and Antonio covered beautifully carfilzomib, so I'm going to actually spend time on some of the other molecules in that regard. In terms of immune suppression, we realize that that's actually a fundamental, and in reality, Thalidomide, it was really our immuno-oncologic. That's what it was. High-dose therapy with melphalan was resetting autologous immunity. I remember when Tim McElwain taught me as a resident that you cytoreduce, you then reset the immune system and use alpha interferon to boost it. That's what he was doing in the early 80s. So this paradigm has been around for a while, and I think we're only beginning now to fully recognize what it means. Let's spend a little bit of time on that. And then lastly, 
by way of segue for Ove, I'm going to speak a little bit about genomic abnormalities in the context of what we do as a partnership with our French colleagues, and to particularly acknowledge Ove and Nikhil from our team who have really led the charge here in targeting and overcoming mutations. And I'm going to frame that around the idea of where does high dose therapy belong, for example, um, with novel therapies, and to use the partnership that we have with our French colleagues in the IFM for the determination IFM 2009 studies to illustrate how we can go forward. Okay, so with that in mind, move fairly quickly because I realize I'm between here and Herve and supper, so we've got a, and we have drinks waiting, so I'll be very quick. The bottom line here is that protein degradation has become a key target, and I just want you to have a few takeaway points. Upstream, there are some new targets, the so-called deubiquilating enzymes, or DUBs. That's a very exciting area. Most importantly, we have the recognition that we don't have just one or two proteasome inhibitors to choose from, but actually a multitude. And I would propose it is not a zero-sum game that each one has its role, be it the first-in-class boronate peptide bortezomib, of course, be it, of course, the very potent epoxy ketone carfilzomib, and now, of course, exazomib as an orally available boronate peptide, and now, very interestingly, merizomib, which is obviously playing a little catch-up here, but fascinatingly targets all three beta subunits. Why does that matter? Because when you inhibit beta-5, you upregulate beta-1 and beta-2, and that's a potent resistance mechanism. So this is a very fertile area. What studies do we have to support it? Well, I just want to acknowledge particularly here the co-investigators in the groups that have worked. That's why I show these slides. This is a remarkable team effort early, the summit trial from years ago that led to the accelerated approval. This was the APEX study, a true international partnership. And I want to especially acknowledge uh, Jean-Luc Harousseau, Pieter Sonnefeld, and the European partners who really made this possible, including also our Israeli colleagues led by Dina Ben Yehuda, as well as others, Mario, uh, the British, and so forth. But a real signal of what was to come in terms of international partnerships. Exazomib has taken that one step further. This is just showing you, obviously, the early phase development of exazomib. In the interest of time, I just want to move to the studies that really led this in terms of phase one efforts, Shaji at Mayo Clinic, ourselves at Dana-Farber, and then, of course, Shaji leading the combination with lenalidomide and dexamethasone going forward in the upfront setting. But very, very importantly, that then built the platform for a study I'm going to come to and spend a little bit of time later, where essentially we combined exazomib with lenalidomide. So with that in mind, what about the IMIDs? Well, I want to spend a little bit of time here because that too has been a remarkable journey. And what I want to talk about specifically is the restoration of immune function and our recognition that the immunomodulators have been a key platform in that process. And then a little bit later we'll talk about monoclonal antibodies and the excitement around emerging newer treatments. So what about the IMIDs? Well, I think it's very important to remember the seminal work from Bart, Bart Barlogi at the University of Arkansas and his team, with the original hypothesis of thalidomide being an antiangiogenic. What was realized, of course, is there's much more to it. And in fact, it's the true immuno-oncologic platform that is deriving probably the multitude of clinical benefit. With that in mind, lenalidomide followed thalidomide in its development, and we learned a lot of lessons from thalidomide in so doing. And just to illustrate these, obviously there's also the better understanding of the science, which has come later, but in fact really helps us understand why these drugs are so good. In that context, there are a number of early phase studies with lenalidomide that then led to the seminal 009 and 010 studies led by Donna Weber and Thanos Dimopoulos that led to the approval of these drugs. And of course, in addition to the first study, which Antonio touched on uh, in his presentation, I want to spend a little bit of time on lenalidomide maintenance because in addition to Michelle's contribution from the IFM, I especially want to acknowledge my colleague Phil McCarthy, who led the lenalidomide after stem cell transplant and myeloma study in the United States. States that has generated a wealth of information for us uh, as we go forward, particularly the impact on survival. And I want to bring to your attention that a meta-analysis will be presented at ASCO as an oral session between Phil and Michelle showing survival benefit to continuous treatment with lenalidomide on the meta-analysis, which is very convincing. So this is exciting stuff. So you've seen basically lenalidomide start in the relapsed refractory setting, move into the upfront setting, and then move into maintenance where it has a key role as part of continuous therapy. In the same context, pomalidomide has been well worth the wait. I just illustrate these studies as an example of the phase ones and twos that have led um, to its development, and in particular to acknowledge Hezo San Miguel and the European team who led the 003 study, which provide a very important platform for approval outside of the US, as well as confirming its role as a relapsed refractory agent uh, in the United States as well.
Now, in the last few minutes, I want to sort of focus on combinations. Combinations in myeloma really matter, but I want to spend a moment to acknowledge how these have been derived. This has not been empiric. It has been truly driven by excellent bench science, and this cartoon summarizes a multitude of work from various laboratories pulling together the construct that you can combine these agents rationally to overcome resistance, and it's this science that's informed the bedside that's given Antonio and I the tools with our respective groups and colleagues and partners to go forward. Obvious example Antonio touched on was led by Hesus, which was, of course, the VISTA study, bortezomib plus melphalan and prednisone, and it became a standard in the, in the European setting, less so in the US for a variety of reasons, but nonetheless very important. One of the real partnerships that it's been a privilege to be part of has been the development of the combination of lenalidomide and bortezomib. I only show this because it's been a remarkable bench-to-bedside story. We were informed primarily by our laboratory colleagues, such as Konstantin and Nicholas Mitsiades, and of course Teru Hidashima in our own laboratories, under Ken's superb mentorship and guidance, guiding us towards this combination. So we were informed by this. Why this is so interesting, and I wanted to spend a moment on it, is that if you look at the more recent work, looking at Icarus and Alios, and some of those pathways dissected by brilliant scientists a few years ago, you might actually hypothesize that the pathways would be antagonistic. In reality, though, in model systems, they're not, and we're still trying to figure out exactly why. And what's particularly true is that in the patient, they are clearly not. IMIDs plus proteasome inhibitors are highly synergistic, yet if you'd gone right back to the molecular basis of the Icarus and Alias pathways, you might think that actually there would be antagonism. The truth is, there isn't. So it's really fascinating to realize how there is a certain amount of accident that happens, but having said that, the models are really those things that can help us see the truth. And by that, I mean actually these are functional models, and in particular, bortezomib-resistant derived patient cells as opposed to otherwise. My point simply being that the science here is complex and requires careful dissection rather than a simplistic approach. In any event, the rationale for the combination is summarized here, and I really just want to especially acknowledge my co-investigators on these respective papers who made all of this possible uh, as part of a team. On that note, it's really a privilege to stand here in front of you and talk about tourmaline. Why? Because this has just been published in the New England Journal, and it represents what I think is a remarkable collaboration between the European and American investigators with the support, of course, and, and key role of Millennium Takeda. Philippe Moreau is the lead investigator and, of course, has led this study, and as I say, literally just published today. Uh, in the New England Journal. And it reflects, I think, a remarkable effort because not only do we see the synergy of the proteasome inhibitor and the immunomodulator illustrated by response with the convenience of the all oral route, but we see in a placebo-controlled trial, remember that because that's important here, the following benefit in terms of progression-free survival. And a lot of people have asked why is this, this not separate early? Well, it's fair to say exazomib is given once a week. You can give it twice a week, and there is evidence that it may be more potent on that schedule. But what's really interesting is that in high-risk disease, you see clearly the clinical benefits. So the argument that somehow it's less potent is interesting, perhaps doesn't quite stand up. But having said that, what's really intriguing to me is the effect of placebo too. That may be relevant here, and that may be why the curves don't separate quite so in early uh, in that regard. Having said all of that, we see a clinical benefit that's impressive and a very well-tolerated combination going forward, particularly attractive, as Antonio uh, pointed out, for our older, frailer patients. In the context of pomalidomide-based therapy, I just wanted to mention how powerful that was in terms of combination strategies, not to dwell on that, but the reason to emphasize it is because in this context, we have the following combination of pomalidomide, dexamethasone exazomid, led by my colleague Pete Voorhees, in the alliance which we're taking forward. And I simply show it to give you an idea in this phase one experience. These are relapsed double refractory patients. You're seeing remarkable response rates from an all oral uh, 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 com combination. So to Antonio's point, if you have heavily pretreated very sick patients, do we give up? Well, perhaps not because actually with an all oral combination of these new drugs, look at what we're achieving, and obviously that bodes well uh, for the future. Not to be outdone, I just wanted to also show the impact of pomalidomide combined with merizumib. This is very important preclinical work from my colleague Darminda Chauhan, which shows in his model system that this is one of the most potent combinations of all, and Andrew Spencer presented this at Antonio's workshop in Rome um, last year, and it was a very interesting paper. I want to spend a couple of minutes on the histone deacetylase inhibitor space, not popular 
Veronistat was unfortunately disappointing. But having said that, when you sort of meet a challenge, I think you learn more from failure than you do from success, actually. And if you look at what happened with Veronistat, one of the challenges was tolerability. And in that same context, we now have next generation deacetylase inhibitors, panabinostat, and hot on the tail of these drugs is, of course, AC1215 and 241, which have both epigenetic and agrosomal effects. Why is that so interesting? Because of this duality of mechanism, there really does seem to be something very important in this class of drugs, and in particular in the context of its ability to be combined with other backbone agents, be they proteasome inhibitors, as illustrated by the Panorama program, led by Hesus, and I want to again here acknowledge all the teams involved, summarized in these papers, and now most recently, as I say, the HDAC6 selective work, which is being led by my colleague Nupa Rajay, uh, and going forward. So the HDAC space of great interest. Finally, I want to stop and finish by talking about the antibodies. Antonio touched on these and, of course, gave you the punchlines, which is essential. These are going to be game changers, and I absolutely agree with him. I think in that context, we've been long waiting for them, but there's not just daratumumab. I do want to bring your attention to the Sanofi compound, SAR650984, or isotuximab. Isotuximab is really very interesting, has some of the same, obviously, very similar properties to Dara, um, but not all CD38 antibodies are alike. In fact, the morphosis compound actually failed as a monotherapy. May be successful as a combo, but that remains to be seen. In any event, suffice to say, this is a very important target. And there are others, including ELO and more. I'm going to focus on DARA briefly. D'Antonio touched on this, but I just want to bring to your attention the multitude of effects, and the effects not just on the tumor, but also on the neighborhood, which may be very relevant. And obviously, there have been some beautiful papers published in this space now. Um, our own work, Antonio and I have been privileged to be part of the 501 team. At the same time, there's been a beautiful effort led by Sagalonio with the U.S. study, which led to actually the combination of these two studies uh, to FDA approval. Elotuzumab, Antonio touched on. I think the real message here, this is a real immuno-oncologic. It's an adjuvant antibody which you need a partner drug for. Antonio presented that when you combine it with bortezomib, interestingly enough, it has clinical benefit. Obviously, the major platform is with uh, the IMIDs. But having said that, I think it's a very promising antibody. And in that context, we've had, again, a remarkable team effort that led to the Eloquent 2 study being positive in favor um, of the three drugs. I should mention that at ASH, we updated this and showed that actually there's a strong trend now towards survival, which is very interesting. Checkpoint inhibitors are a very exciting space. This has been led by a number of investigators, in particular Hezo San Miguel and also uh, Ashraf Badros and others in the U.S., and I think it's showing real promise. Uh, vaccinations, another critical strategy of augmenting immunity. This is work of my colleague Jackie Rosenblatt with David Avigan's mentorship. And moving into this space too is wonderful new vaccine strategies. I'm sorry, I beg your pardon, I'll go back one. Um, where in fact you can target idiotypes. This work actually led by Nikhil in our group where we're actually looking to very specifically target immune response in patients. And I think it's very promising. So in the last minute or so, I just wanted to spend a bit of time on the targeting of genomic abnormalities by way of segue for Hervé, and at the same time to drive to what I think is one of our most precious partnerships, and that's actually the partnership we have with our IFM colleagues. And what I want to focus on is how best to integrate therapeutic strategies and indeed the emerging role of MRD to tailor therapy. Very briefly, this is work from Nikhil showing very elegantly how genetic heterogeneity or genomic heterogeneity in myeloma evolves over time. In the same context, this study, the determination trial, has sought to understand genomically how different patients behave across an identical therapeutic paradigm. The key difference being between the French and US studies that we have integrated continuous therapy and lenalidomide throughout in the US, whereas it's only been for one year in France. Very importantly, also, in the context of US practice, we should recognize that salvage therapies are more readily available, so salvage outcomes are different in the US. So again, the sort of message here is that one size does not fit all. And I think this trial has offered us a unique way of exploring and interrogating this question. This is actually the summary of the study, and I'll move through it very quickly. But suffice to say, one thing I wanted to share with you, which has been my privilege to be part of, is the build of the US study group to actually match that 
um, of our French partners. This is a unique study group which we're hoping to continue that will be active going forward. It's composed of the Alliance and the CTN combined and essentially perform, uh, provides a unique hybrid structure um, that we hope will be able to continue uh, to partner and be successful with IFM and other groups as well. Very briefly, we have 54 sites in this group, actually, and U.S. Accrual currently sits at a very robust 650 patients. Now, I wanted to mention very briefly one thing. In the analysis that you saw earlier um, from uh, um, uh, um, Jean-Luc and previously, we see no survival difference for transplant early versus late yet. We do, however, see a significant progression-free survival advantage, which Antonio touched on. One thing that is interesting, and this is not statistically significant, so please don't overread it, the numbers are very small, but I draw you to your attention the toxicity issue, and just to this in particular. And the reason I ask this is because as we think about these treatments, we have to recognize the future and what they may hold in terms of long-term consequences of this. This is also something very interesting. This is whole genome sequencing at diagnosis in a study patient and at relapse. This is work from Hervé and Nikhil. What's so interesting is the following. At diagnosis, you can see here, there are over, over 5,000 mutations. At relapse, there are 12,000. So my point is that we not only need to think about how incredibly unstable genetically this disease is, but also that our treatments may impact on this. And as we throw a net around them, we must be very careful about how we do that. And I just suggest that to you as an ongoing hypothesis. So, very quickly, to finish. Outcomes in myeloma represent extraordinary continued progress, and this is a summary of the FDA approvals in the last decade. In fact, as of this year, there have been 18 FDA approvals over the last 13 years in myeloma, which is unique and extraordinary, and I think reflects an incredible effort. In the same context, there's a very bright future, um, which in the interest of time I think we've covered comprehensively. I especially want to acknowledge this, which is the partnership that's provided that platform going forward. These are the global investigators that I touched on, many of whom are in the room, and especially acknowledge each and every one of you for what you've contributed. Certainly speaking to our own group, it's my privilege um, to work with Ken as my mentor, our fantastic laboratory program, and our wonderful clinical research group illustrated here. However, could not do any of this, as Antonio mentioned, um, without my family, especially my two rescue dogs. <laughs> but having said that, they put up with me, which is more than anything. And I want to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you.